Hello, I am recording this message on Friday, August 11th, 2023. This is my pre-recorded version of my message on Sunday, August 13th, 2023. I am Pastor Kevin of Antioch Church in Springfield, Missouri. If you're ever anywhere near Springfield, Missouri, please join us on Sundays at 8.30 or 11 a.m. I promise you, you will be warmly welcomed and you will be inspired by the message and the music and we are at 3614 North State Highway H in Springfield, Missouri. You are doing much better than you realize you are. That's today's message. You might walk around with aches and pains. You may be painfully aware of your shortcomings and your, your, your problems in your body, your own medical problems. You might not get as many phone calls as you used to get. Maybe you keep trying to get ahead with your finances, but then something unexpected comes up and you have to write more checks to cover a doctor visit or medical tests or a car repair or an ER trip. And all that adds up, I get it. And it's hard to get ahead with your finances. You may be trying and praying to make something happen in your life and not seeing results. And you may get discouraged, but you're doing great. You really are. In Isaiah 43, verse four, in the Passion Translation, God says to you right now, you are precious in my eyes and honored and I love you. God said that to ancient Israel, and God says that to you right now. In 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, in the Passion Translation, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthian Christians, with an open heart, let me freely say how very proud I am of you, and how often I, I boast about you. In fact, when I think of you, my heart is greatly encouraged and overwhelmed with joy despite our many troubles. That's God's heart towards you right now. When God thinks of you, God's heart is encouraged. God's heart is overwhelmed with joy despite your many troubles, despite your sins, despite your mistakes and flaws. God is proud of you. Now, be proud of yourself. I mentioned in a couple of videos ago on this channel that things didn't go very well the first time that Jesus preached the word of God in the synagogue. In Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29, all the people in the synagogue were furious at Jesus. They got up and drove him out of the town and took him to throw him off the cliff. But he was doing better than they thought he was. And you are doing better than people give you credit for. In fact, when Jesus hung on the cross, dying on Calvary's uh, cross, the people who were there assumed that he must have done something really bad for God to let that happen to him. It's in the Bible, Isaiah chapter 53. It says that surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God. Was God punishing Jesus for his sins when he was crucified? Of course not. But it seemed like that. It seemed that Jesus was being punished by God for, for something that he had done at the crucifixion. You may go through problems and pain, and you might think, why, God? What did I do wrong? But your problems and your pain are not punishments for your sins. God already poured out his punishment for your sins and my sins on the cross. So if you ever think, what did I do to deserve this? The answer is nothing. Problems happen to all of us. 
You might have done something to bring a problem upon yourself. A lot of people bring problems upon themselves, but that's not God. Oftentimes, people suffer the consequences of their own actions. And that's the way that God has set up life. If you do something, there's a cause and effect relationship. But don't blame God. In Acts 18, verses 4 and verse 6, the Apostle Paul was a missionary who was trying to get people to understand Jesus and learn about God. And verse 4 says, Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. Verse 8, But when they opposed Paul, they became abusive. No one should be physically or verbally abusive to you. But when they were abusive to the Apostle Paul, he could have went home and thought, what am I doing wrong? And he might not have been doing anything wrong in his way of, of presenting the gospel. It was them. When someone reacts to you in a certain way, unless you've obviously done something to tick them off or offend them or insult them, it has more to do with them than with you. The Apostle Paul wasn't doing anything wrong when it came to presenting Jesus to the Jews and Greeks. It was how they responded to him. In Acts 18, the same chapter, verses 9 and 10, it says, One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision saying, do not be afraid, keep on speaking, do not be silent, for I am with you. You see, the Apostle Paul was doing better than they thought he was. And in Acts chapter 18, no longer would Paul continue to take abuse from the Jews. He said, and I quote, from now on I will go to the Gentiles. See, walk away from anyone who puts you down, who demeans you, who abuses you. You're actually doing better than they think you are. John the Baptist sent a message to Jesus asking him, are you the one who is to come or should we look for another? In other words, I'm not sure you're quite measuring up to what we expect from the one sent by God. Now, was Jesus doing something wrong? Was he not really doing his mission? No, he was, he was doing exactly what God wanted him to do. It wasn't his fault that he didn't measure up to what the Messiah or Son of God should be in the eyes of his older cousin, John the Baptist. Luke 7 verse 21 says, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. It says many, not all. So I guess many people healed wasn't enough for John the Baptist, the older cousin of Jesus. But it was enough for God. For some people, you will never do enough. For some people, you will never be enough. But no matter what anybody says, no matter what your mom or dad says, no matter what your boss says, you are enough. And you're doing better than you think you are. And you're doing better than they think you are. God says you're enough. His grace is sufficient for you. Sometimes we pray for people and we don't see anything happen, any change, or we see little results. I know, I get it, I've been there, you've been there. What happens when you pray for someone? This is how I would describe it. When you pray for someone, your son, your daughter, your nephew, a coworker, the Holy Spirit goes to work to bring truth and light and guidance and comfort to, to the one that you're praying for. When you're praying for someone, 
The Holy Spirit will move on that person's mind and heart and bring a feeling of calm and peace and will give that person the idea to go to this doctor or apply for this job or go in this direction with their career. That's what God's Spirit does for the person you're praying for. But here's the thing. If that person you're praying for decides to continually think, what should I do? I don't know what to do. It's not going to work out. I'm not going to make it. I have no clue. Then that person will be intentionally filling his or her mind full of doubt and full of fear. No matter how much peace you're praying for, for that person. Because the stress hormone will be pumping through that person's body and creating stress. Does that make sense? So if you pray for, say, your nephew Johnny, or your co-worker Steve, or your granddaughter Jenny, God has heard you. God is faithful. God is not forgetful. And the Holy Spirit is working on that person. But that person you're praying for has to allow themselves to receive that calm, to receive that peace, to receive those fresh new ideas. And if that person you're praying for is continually filling their mind with what will I do? I don't know what to do. It's not going to work out. This is the end. Then that person you're praying for is actually counteracting everything that God's Spirit is bringing to them. But if the person you're praying for opens their mind to God and begins to, to agree with the Bible and say things like, well, the Bible says I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to pay these bills. Somehow, some way, my bills are all going to get paid. It's going to work out. When the person you're praying for is thinking and talking like that, that person is agreeing with God's word, actually flowing with the Holy Spirit. And then your prayers are effective. But we have to let it happen. When I'm being prayed for, I have to open my mind, open my heart to God. This is why Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 1, do not let your heart be troubled. And Hebrews 3, 7 and 8 says, therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoke me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness. God was working on the hearts and minds of the Israelites who left Egypt in the Exodus. But many of them complained and griped and hardened their hearts. And when, their, when a person's heart is hardened, it's a closed heart, closed mind. Therefore, it can't receive. If DoorDash comes to my, my door, I got to open the door or I'm not going to get it. I may have paid for it online, but if I don't open the door, I'm not going to get the food from DoorDash. Many people's hearts and minds are like closed doors. doesn't work. The Apostle Paul said in Colossians 3, verses 15 and 16, for us to let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Verse 16, let, there's that word again, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Look at how often in these verses the word let is there. Those verses are not being spoken to God. They're being spoken to who? To us. We have to let not our heart be troubled. We have to not harden our heart. We have to let the peace of Christ rule. We have to let the word of God dwell in our hearts. 
We have to cooperate with God, agree with the Bible, flow with the energy of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4, 30 and 31, in the Passion Translation. So never grieve the Spirit of God or take for granted His holy influence in your life. Lay aside bitter words, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, and insults. So when you're praying for someone, there is a heavenly, holy, spiritual influence that is going to that person's heart and that person's mind. Your prayers are powerful, but if that person is grieving the Spirit of God, if that person is engaging in, it said, temper tantrums, revenge, profanity, you might as well say drama, all those things close a person's mind and heart to, to the holy influence of your prayers. And the problem is not with your prayers. The problem is with the person who is receiving them. The, the, the recipient of your prayers has to have an open mind, an open heart. Look, if I'm sick and I go to the doctor and he prescribes a medication, he says, this will work. And I go to the pharmacy and I get my prescription filled. But then I go home and I say, what does he know? Well, whatever. And I throw the medication in the trash. And then I'm still sick for days and weeks. I can't blame the doctor. I can't blame the pharmacist. In that scenario, who do I blame? Me. You have to, you gotta look in the mirror at, at the one to blame for lots of problems that happen to you. That's stepping on toes, but it's truth. We have to cooperate with God. We have to agree with God's word, open our minds and let the peace in. And talk faith and think faith. If you pray for someone, like your nephew, your, your grandson, your co-worker, and then say a week and a half later, you talk to him and you say, so, so how you doing? I've been praying for you, how you doing? If that person says, oh, I'm still upset. I'm, I'm still heartbroken. I'm still a wreck. I'm still a mess. I'm still scared. I'm still anxious. I don't know what to do then that person may need more prayer. And we don't condemn them. But don't condemn yourself either or God. Don't think that prayer doesn't work or that your prayers don't work or that God's mad at you or mad at them or any of that. Those are all lies on the enemy designed to get you to pray less often. God does hear when you pray. God's Spirit is working on the person or persons that you're praying for. Your prayers are doing more than you think they are. Check this out. In 1912, a medical missionary named Dr. William Leslie went to bring the Bible truth and medicine to the tribal people in a remote corner of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. He was originally a pharmacist until he became a Christian in 1888. He moved to the Chicago area where, where God began to, to work on his heart with a desire to become a medical missionary. Now, unlike those with, with closed hearts, this man, William Leslie, had an open heart, open mind to God. So when God worked on his heart and mind, he went along with it. He volunteered. He stepped up. And, and long story made short, he went to, to Central Africa to become a medical missionary. He would travel through the jungles and teach the Bible. And he taught the tribal children how to read and write. He talked about the importance of education and told Bible stories. He started the first organized educational system in those villages. 
His goal was to spread Christianity. But he had a falling out with some of the tribal leaders, and he was asked not to come back. So he and his wife both left. After 17 years, he went back to the United States, a discouraged man, believing that he failed. He thought that he failed to make a real impact for Christ. He thought that he had wasted 17 years. He died nine years after his return to, to the U.S. But many years later, in 2010, a missionary team made a shocking discovery. They found in that area of the world a network of churches hidden in the dense jungle where Dr. Leslie had been stationed. That missionary team said, when we got in there, we found a whole network of churches throughout the jungle. Each village had its own gospel choir. They wrote their own songs and would have, have sing-offs from village to village. They found a church in each of the eight villages they visited scattered across 34 miles. So Dr. William Leslie, whose name I had never heard of before, this medical missionary, he thought that he had wasted 17 long years of his life. But it wasn't true. He and his wife definitely made a bigger impact than they realized. And you make a bigger impact and impression upon people than you realize. Your prayers are more powerful than you realize. And you're doing much better than you realize. Thank you for watching. Have an awesome weekend. God bless.